Are you ready for some Jersey? Well, we've got Jersey. The zipper was made here. The light bulb was made here. The color television calls the Garden State home. Everybody wants to know about New Jersey. Sandy beaches, beautiful cities. We even have the Jersey Turnpike. Inventors, music, the movies. You need an exit? We got them too. You want Jersey? This is Jersey. Today we're traveling to scenic Lambertville to get an authentic farm experience at Howell Living History Farm. The farm exists and operates just as it did at the turn of the 20th century, delighting guests of all ages with its rural heritage. We took a tour with the farm's director, Pete Watson, as he shared his impressive knowledge of New Jersey's farming history. This is a 130-acre farm that has been one for almost 270 years. It was donated to Mercer County in 1974 by the Howell family of Pennington and our County Park Commission has restored it so that it looks and operates the way it did a century ago with the idea that people can experience the lifestyle and farming and rural landscape that was part of our county during that time period. So we host um, school groups and the general public and invite them to explore the farm and join us for all the seasonal activities that occur here. Time to collect eggs, Gary. Let's go. So we're going in actual chicken coop here, huh? This is it. This is a chicken coop just like the one that was here a century ago. Mm -hmm. And the experience that we're about to share is one that farm families... <laughs> Very nice. Uh, so there's about 50 chickens on the farm? Yeah, this has a flock of 50 barred Plymouth rocks. And this time of year they're laying about an egg a day per mm -hmm. bird. This is where they eat? Yeah, this is their feeder and we're giving them a commercial feed that you know, ensures that their productivity is at the right level. And there were commercial feeds available at the time, so this is not, you know, a new practice, this is an old one. So meaning instead of uh, table goods, uh, leftovers, you give them commercial, is that what you mean by commercial feed? Well, you, you bought it from the mill, you okay. know, and it was made of cracked corn and wheat and um, some minerals. You know, they certainly knew what it took to, you know, maintain, you know, healthy poultry. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of the um, components of it. But we also take corn that we grow and we crack that corn um, and, and throw that on the, on the ground. That's scratch mm -hmm. and chickens like to scratch. So that's one of the jobs that visitors often get to do is, mm -hmm. is shell and grind corn and make chicken scratch. Mm -hmm. But the other job is, you know, is collecting the collecting eggs. The egg, and, so. you know, we want visitors to know that in order to produce eggs, you know, you have to properly feed your chickens. So, you know, here's the, the end product right here. And these were all laid this morning, not by one bird, but by a series of four who came in and took turns sitting in this nest box. Mm -hmm. They each laid an egg. You see? It's warm. Wow. It's a warm egg, that's for sure. Now, you know, one of the things that the donor wrote in a letter that accompanied the gift of the farm was that she thought it would be wonderful if children today could experience the thing that she loved the most about living and growing up on a farm, which was reaching under a hen and getting a warm egg. So Gary, I'm going to invite you to reach underneath this hen okay. and see if there's a warm egg. Is there an egg? Uh, there is an egg. Bring it out. Interesting. Is it warm? Very warm. Okay, so Inez Hal hope that you would have that experience. Wow. Um, and our county park system is committed to making sure that every visitor who comes has that opportunity. Interesting. And both of my parents had this opportunity when they were younger, so it yeah. gave me an opportunity to do the same. How many eggs do you produce here a day? Uh, 50 birds. Probably 45 to 50 eggs. Now, you mentioned earlier that some of your food goes to the, uh, the food bank, is that correct? Right. Um, we share the surpluses with our volunteers um, and also with community food banks. Um, and that's because the economic formula that made this viable at, at the turn of the century is no longer viable. Our product is education. But any of the, the products of the farm, we want to be sure, are used for educational um, purposes and so if a volunteer helps us clean the hen house and they get to take home a dozen eggs that helps um, solidify that experience and make it more interesting and valuable um, at the same time you know we might ask them to collect all the eggs and put them on the truck that we're taking down to the Greater Mercer Food Co-op mm -hmm. along with the potatoes that they help us harvest so that you know we share all of the the, the surpluses or the products of the farm with the community and that's Interesting. Makes it a lot of fun. So, Pete, what do we have here? 
Well, we have our uh, flock of Suffolk Romney Cross sheep heading over toward the pond to have their morning drink. Um, these are breeds that were uh, kept in this valley at the period of interpretation. And uh, we use them uh, primarily for wool. So some of the things that visitors get to do is help us process that wool as you know farmers would have at the time of the, um, the farm's interpretation people weren't really spinning the way they did on great wheels or like maybe grandma was still doing in the house, but they were sending it away to mills because by then you had industrialization was impacting the way we helped work with fibers and um, produce clothing and, and uh, textiles. But, you know, sheep were important in the area and so we present this as part of the, the livestock scene that you would have found if you traveled back in time to this farm. So where do you send the wool now? Uh, there's a, a number of mills that will process individually your fleece. And sometimes uh, we'll just give people who are volunteering for us and helping us interpret the farm um, a fleece so that they can learn how to spin or maybe they already know what they're doing um, and they like to make things at home. So that's one of the fun things that uh, is in it for a volunteer. So do you sell any of the livestock for food? No, we don't. Our product is education. Um, and our Park Commission is very committed to making the farm part of the recreational and educational programs that are offered through all 22 of our facilities. In that vein, we offer dozens and dozens of public programs and school programs that let people experience this. If you took the economics of this farm and put them in the year 2014, they wouldn't work. Um, you know, you'd be out of business in a couple of days. They did work at the turn of the century. Um, and so that's what we present, is, is a farming system and a lifestyle that was viable um, and that was common, and we let people experience it. And, and that's who we are, what we do, um, that's what our goal is. Um, and it's, it's really a pleasure for all of us to be, to be part of that and to bring that experience to 65,000 annual visitors. Pete, thank you so much for this information. What we do, we're gonna take a break, we'll come back. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. We're here in the horse barn. See what's going on here. So tell me, what happened this morning? We're here at what? It's eight o'clock now. Eight o'clock, Friday morning. Horses are getting ready for a day of work out in the fields, and we're presenting the farming and lifestyle of a typical Mercer County farm at the turn of the 20th century. So the horses that you see in the barn with us are work horses um, that would have been used at the turn of the century on most Mercer County farms to do the plowing, the planting, hauling, going to town, um, going to visit the neighbors. And we have six to do all the work, just as they would have done it. Now these are huge horses. No biters, no kickers, good behavior, used to the public, and, and used to visitors who may not be accustomed to farming settings and animals like this. So, you know, a kid's gonna may want to walk up and, and pet the back of that horse. Mm -hmm. Well, normally you wouldn't touch the back of a horse, but you know, we have to make sure that everything we have, you know, is able to tolerate the kinds of encounters with people and visitors that are likely to occur. Tell me what's involved in reference to the cost to, to have horses like this here. How much do they eat? That sort of thing. A workhorse can cost you anywhere from a thousand to five thousand dollars depending on how much breeding is in it. But um, a typical farm horse of the, of the times, and that's a century ago, wasn't a fancy um, big draft horse like Budweiser might have, um, you know, or a hauling company might have for promotional purposes or for doing work in the cities. Farm horses were a cross between lighter horses and those heavy horses, and so you very often found a horse like this, Tom, who's well, he's 1,400 pounds, whereas a Clydesdale is 2,200 pounds. So, you know, even though these seem like big horses compared to the ones that you may have seen um, at the racetrack or, you know, under saddle, they're not nearly as big as the great big draft horses that we associate with um, 
some of the commercial uses. Mm -hmm. Let's see, you have some of your staff working with the horses here. What, what happens? So it's morning time, they're having breakfast. Uh, what is your staff doing here now? Well, these guys are historic farmers. They've learned the skills that go into using these horses to farm um, with methods that there's a typical scene here every morning where the horses come in from a night being in pasture where they can eat, they get cleaned, then they get um, harnessed and you know while this is happening they're finishing up their breakfast. You know we've been very I think successful in creating those opportunities so if your school group comes out we expect that you'll help us harvest ice in the winter or help us pick corn this time of year so it's very interesting. Or, or help us clean the barn. Right. Same thing if you come out with your family on on a Saturday, the first thing we're going to say is, well, are the kids ready to help us out? We've got lots of chores to do. So we're going to collect eggs, we're going to clean the barn, we're going to... So you don't come well, you don't come well dressed when you come here. It's very interactive. Ready, ready for work. Right. You know. And how old is this barn that we're standing in? Well, this section is mid-19th century, and we've had to restore parts of it because time has worn away some of the original material, but it's a property that's on the National Register. So we've taken great care to make sure that as we've, you know, continued to use it, that we didn't do things to the barn, uh, the structure itself, that would compromise its integrity as, um, you know, a preserved building. What was this area used, or what is this area used for here? Well, this is where we milk the cow. How many cows do you have on the farm? We typically keep one cow, and that would be what a family would have had um, to provide the milk that it needed for the kitchen or for making butter. You know, you might raise pigs. We know that at the turn of the 20th century, there was a good market for uh, pork in Philadelphia and in Trenton, Taylor pork roll and Trenton pork roll. So farmers in this area knew that and they picked up on it and, you know, they started raising more pigs. So if you look at the livestock uh, census at the turn of the 20th century, you see that those hog numbers were up. So we have the horses coming out. What's, what's happening now? Ian and Alex are getting Jack and Chester ready to go to work this morning. So uh, they're already cleaned and harnessed, and now they're going to put the lines on them. That's what you use to drive them. So they put them together the way they're going to work. Then they're going to drive them over to the wagon behind us, hook to that wagon, and go on down to the, uh, one of the barns where there's a load of potatoes that we're going to be moving. So this happens seven days a week? Well, on Sunday is our day of rest, and you know, we still take care of the horses, but we don't do any field work. That's a day of visiting um, in our interpretive plan. We talked earlier about the, the schools that you get here. Yeah. Um, where do they come from? Oh, all over. Um, I would say that 70% are from Mercer County. We're a Mercer County park, and we, you know, we try to serve our, our residents as best we can. We have folks from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Hunterton County, um, Burlington to the south. Um, but you know, the internet has, has really changed the, um, the way that people find educational and recreational opportunities. And we find more and more that people come from all over the state. And we had this past weekend from Massachusetts and North Carolina. They were visiting family or they were on their way to uh, New York City and they saw how Living History Farm, this looks interesting. So they stopped by and they helped us harvest potatoes. Mm -hmm. And they come out and participate in whatever it is we're doing, planting crops, harvesting crops, working in the garden, spreading manure. Um, and you know, they have a lot of fun incorporating all those experiences into their curriculum and the learning experience that they've uh, mapped out for the, for the school group. They're so interested in um, the science, the technology, the engineering, uh, the math you know, that goes into and is behind a farm. So how many minutes does it take to set the horses up once they come out of the barn? Uh, just 10 minutes. It's um, just a matter of putting the lines on and driving them over and hitching them to the wagon. And, you know, there's a very um, clear procedure for doing that. And, you know, we double check, make sure everything is done right. Um, safety is always a, you know, a high priority. As the year 1900, people thought that this was quite an improvement over the systems that had preceded it. Right. So it all becomes relative and that make, makes it all the more interesting. They're now sitting on the wagon and Ian is holding a set of lines. When you ride a horse, you have reins. When you drive a horse, you have lines. So he's got the lines and he's ready to go. Very good. Coming up next, we take a tour of the farm's historic farmhouse.
Well, this is the farmhouse that was part of this farmstead for nearly two centuries, and it was built in sections, and we've recently restored and reopened it to the public as a house showing the lifestyle at the turn of the 20th century. So this was a massive undertaking that involved um, planning and uh, fund, you know, gathering, um, as well as um, interviewing people in the neighborhood about the history of farming and the way houses were kept, how they were furnished. Um, so to see it now at this stage, you know, is really exciting for all of us as a staff because many of us have worked together here for 20 or 30 years and it was always our dream to see the house restored. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's happened. Um, and it took a, a tremendous team effort. We just look at the sign, what it took to preserve this structure, which is on the National Register. But um, one of the things that I, that I really you know, appreciate is that um, the county has given such extraordinary support to the effort to preserve this farmstead for people of Mercer County and, and the area. It's just one of those stories that, that shows you know, how a community has embraced the concept of preserving something that's of value to them and, and has done it well. So we see out here the, the two different sections. Tell me about that. Well, the oldest section of the house was built right around um, 1800, 1805. And that's where the family um, not only cooked and you know, shared time together, but you know, they had their bedrooms upstairs and the guests. And if they had a hired hand, you know, everybody was right there. It wasn't very big. Um, but as the family grew, they had, had to add on. And as the house got bigger, so did the barns. You know, they were doing more and more farming and they needed more space for livestock and equipment and so forth. So it's an interesting story and it's reflected in the changing um, shape um, and size of the buildings that are on the property. Now, can we go inside? Let's take a tour. Wow, you've done a lot of great work here. Tell me, um, it was, took four years to, to clean this place up? Well, the restoration process was um, typical of, of many and it involved research as well as um, planning and getting the right finishes. As you see now, the wallpaper, the moldings, uh, the floors, you know, these are painstaking processes that involve uh, lots of uh, input from, um, you know, preservation specialists and the State Historic Preservation Office, as well as our contractors who are experts in restoration. Um, everyone has to understand what the needs and, and uses of the program are. And this is a living history farm, so there aren't gonna be velvet uh, ropes here that keep you from going into these rooms. The public is going to go through all these rooms and actually do and experience the things that happened here. So behind us is the formal parlor and that's where you would have had guests on Sunday. Um, you might come in and sit down and um, play the organ or play cards and share stories. So we're just getting ready to, to furnish this room. We have everything now um, that belongs here. It'll be fun to let the public and school kids come in and see what it was like to live in a house like this. Now this section was built in 1850, you said, that yeah. plus or minus? Yeah, yeah. Let's go into the original section. That's even more interesting. Let's go in there. Yeah, this is the oldest section. Here's the original wall. You can see the thickness. That's all stone behind there. Um, it, it wasn't huge by standards of today, but this was the, the space where the family cooked, uh, gathered, um, did homework, shared stories. Um, up above were the bedrooms and of course we're, we have this wonderful southern exposure with these big windows that let lots of sunlight and warmth in in the winter when there weren't leaves on the trees, yet um, these thick walls and those maple trees provided um, some protection and kept the house cool during the summer. You can notice the temperature in here right now. What was the average family size back then? Families tended to be bigger then. You need lots of labor to um, do everything that was needed on a farm. And so, you know, the more children you had, uh, the, the smoother the operation went. Um, and if you, if you didn't have a large family, you were in the position of having to hire the neighbor kids or a hired hand to get all the work done. So big families were part of the story and um, everybody slept together. Um, the kids <laughs> upstairs, uh, the heat went up through vents in the ceiling, and, uh, and that's how you, you manage to get through the, the winters. I see there's a set of stairs over here. Tell me, this was the staff's stairs? No, this was the way to get upstairs. 
to the bedroom. Oh, in the original, right. Yep. And, um, you know, visitors can climb these stairs and go on up and see what those bedrooms look like. Great. Can we take a look? Sure. Come on up. Boy, these are steep steps, but I guess that's what you had to do to save money and space, right? Yeah, they're part of the efficiency of the day. So this would be one of the bedrooms? Yes. Um, and an interesting aspect of this room is that there was a window on what had been the, or what is the north side. And when they added on in 1869 another wing, they closed this window over. So as we did the restoration work, um, and remove some of the material here, we discovered that when they closed the window in, they plastered over the opening and they wrote their names on it. So the names of everyone who was here on July 21st, 1865 um, is represented here. We call this the writing on the wall. Um, and we know the history, the stories behind each and every person whose name is here, thanks to the work of our historian, Larry Kidder. So I guess the added value of students coming here is that they are able to see not only the farm, but to see how a family lived. Well, that's exactly right. Um, in planning this, we have an interpretive plan that provides uh, programs for involving the public and school groups in the actual activities that occurred inside the house. So cooking inside the kitchen or bringing firewood um, in for the kitchen stove, bringing ice in for the ice box, sitting around the quilt frame downstairs in the parlor and learning how to quilt or helping make a quilt, sewing on a tread-powered sewing machine, playing a pump organ, playing cards. These, these were things that happened in the house because they had to um, or were part of the social life of the times. And so um, our interpretive plan allows for all these things to happen inside the house and for visitors to experience them and become part of them. It sure was a pleasure being here at the Howell Living History Farm. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining us. See you again next time.